All right, in this video, we're gonna introduce a really important concept, the concept that's actually the link between differential or first quarter calculus and integral or second quarter calculus. Before we get into definitions and theorems, I first wanna talk about the role of constants when we differentiate. In this case right here, I have three different functions, 2x squared plus five, 2x squared minus eight, and 2x squared plus nine. The important thing here is that if I differentiated each of these, f of x, g of x, and h of x, I would all get the same thing. Or specifically, f prime of x is equal to g prime of x, which is equal to h prime of x, which all equal four x. And that's obviously not new news to us, but the important thing here is, is because when we differentiate, the constant terms go away, that if we have functions that are identical, except for the constant at the end here, they will all have the same derivative. The goal of this video is to introduce you to the idea of antiderivatives, which is going backwards with the differentiation process, or starting with something like 4x and turning it into one of these original functions. The really important thing is though, is that you won't be able to get out a specific function unless you're given information about how to find this constant value. All right, in order to move forward, we need a definition for the antiderivative, and here it is right here. It's what you'd expect. You'll see this in action a few times in this video. A function, capital F, is called the antiderivative of F if the derivative of this function is equal to the original function. So to tie together that definition with the previous conversation, if I was being asked here to find an antiderivative for the function 4x, I have many options. One of the options I could have here would be 2x squared plus 5. The important thing to say is there's actually an infinite number of antiderivatives I could choose just by changing this constant right here. The only important thing is that I would have this 2x squared as a term and then plus any constant. I mean, again, these examples right here, I have three functions that I could have chosen as the antiderivative of 4x because when you take the derivative of them, you end up with 4x. Again, this piece right here is an important emphasis in the first steps of finding antiderivatives. It's arbitrary what constant I choose to add on. I didn't have to choose any constant if I didn't want to, but because when I differentiate this antiderivative, I'll get this no matter what this constant value is. So it might feel a little bit strange that when we anti-differentiate, we get this, this choice of constant, right? If there's a bunch of different antiderivatives for any function because of this constant term. But what we've developed is this idea of the most general derivative of a function. And so if f is an antiderivative, any of your antiderivatives of f, then the most general antiderivative for f is f plus c, or f of x plus c. This plus c right here is denoting the fact that there's this arbitrary constant that could be added on, that any function that starts with f, your antiderivative, and adding or subtracting any constant value afterwards will still be an antiderivative of your original function. So let's start building some rules and properties that help us find these antiderivatives. So here I'm being asked to find the general antiderivative of f of x equals 6x squared plus 10x minus 7. And again, this statement about the most general or the general antiderivative is just a bit about this plus c statement, and you'll see how that will be involved in one second. So the game is, I'm trying to find a function, let's call this big F of x, which is generally our notation that we use in the beginning of antiderivatives. I want to put a function here so that when I take its derivative, I'll end up with this. And when I'm first doing this, it's really important is that as you're writing this antiderivative, just use differentiation to check your answer. So first things first, when I differentiate, I can analyze each term separately, right? That's those are sum and difference rules. That's really important. So here I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to think of each of these terms separately. My first question is, is what term would I put here? So when I differentiate, I would get 6x squared. When I'm doing this, I need to think about differentiation, right? When I differentiate, what do I do with these polynomial terms? I use the power rule where I take an exponent, I bring it down, and then I subtract one away. So the first thing that I know is that right here, I'm going to want an x cubed term because when I differentiate the x cubed term, I'm gonna bring down the three and take one away from the exponent to make it an x squared. Then the question becomes, well, what do I want here as a coefficient? But I just said what the power rule is again, right? I'm gonna take this three and multiply it by whatever number is here and take one away. 
Well, I want the number here that when I multiply it by three, I get to six, and that answer is two. And the beauty, again, with antiderivatives, I can always check my work. And it's good to guess at times, and then check this and tweak your understanding. In this case right here, this would be the first term for this antiderivative, because when I differentiate this term right here, I bring the three down, multiply it by two, you get the six, and then take one away from this exponent to make it an exponent of two. That leads us to think about, well, then what is the opposite of the power rule? Well, if you look at what we're doing right here, what the anti-power rule is, is we're always going to add one to the exponent because the opposite of subtracting one here. So when I anti-differentiate, I'm going to take my exponent and I'm going to add one. So not only do I add one, what do I do with this coefficient out front? Well, I made the two a three, and then I would think about taking that six and dividing it by three. So the anti-power rule actually looks just like this. So again, all I'm writing right here is doing the opposite of this. But whenever you try to use any of these rules again, you can always differentiate your terms to find out if it does differentiate into the original function, because that's the entire goal. Let's try this rule now with this term right here. So what it says is I have 10x. It says take the x and add one to that exponent. So in this case right here, I'm going to have 10x squared. So I add one to that. But then I divide by two is what this rule is right here. The trick to remembering this anti-power rule is that this number and this number will always be the same. So whatever I change this exponent into when I bump it up, that's the number I'm going to divide by. And again, we'll confirm that to, be, to work here in a second. The final step is what to do with this term, and this should be pretty straightforward. Be what, the, what would the term be to differentiate to get to negative seven? Well, then this must have been a negative seven x. Cleaning this up real fast will give us that our antiderivative here is 2x cubed plus 5x squared minus 7x. And I'm also going to add on this plus c to denote the fact that I want the most general derivative. I could add any constant on. And again, just to verify this, I might as always take the derivative. The game is if my answer is correct, when I differentiate this, I'll get back to the original function. In this case right here, the power rule gives me a 6x squared. Here in this middle term, the where I use this anti-power rule, what this gives me is a plus 10x. That's exactly what I was looking for. And then as I stated here, the derivative of negative 7x is just negative 7. And then when I differentiate with this constant, since it's a constant, it goes to 0. So this right here confirms that this is the general form of my antiderivative of the original function f of x. All right, we have one more example here. We're given the function f of x equals e to the x plus sine of x, and we're asked to find the antiderivative. By the way, if you didn't, haven't seen anything like this yet, we will have a full list and methods for finding antiderivatives. Again, if you're getting into Calc 2, Calc 2, which is integral calculus, is all about doing this antiderivative work, and there's lots of other advanced techniques. But again, here we want to just think about this through the lens of differentiation. In this case right here, I'm going to again attack each term separately because when I differentiate, I'm allowed to do that. So I have f of x here. This first term will be pretty easy, right? I need to figure out what do I differentiate? What term becomes e to the x? Well, that's just like the definition of the derivative of e to the x, right? If I put e to the x here first and I differentiate it, I'll get out e to the x. And in this second term, I have sine of x. The question is, what do I differentiate to get sine of x? Well, we know when we differentiate sine and cosine, they just flip back and forth with a, a negative or positive. So we could say that this would be the cosine of x. Obviously, we'd be adding a c on here as a constant. Now, importantly, we always want to differentiate just to double check our work right here. So if we find the derivative of this function, we're, we're calling the antiderivative. We're sure as heck hoping it come, turns into this original function. In this case right here, e to the x, of course, just gives me e to the x. The derivative of the cosine of x is negative sine of x. And the derivative of, zero or of, of a constant is 0. So there seems to be an issue here. When I differentiated this, I didn't get my original function right here because I got this negative or this subtraction between the two terms. 
That's not a big deal though, because if I just go back to this and I change this from addition into subtraction, that negative that pops out when I differentiate the cosine will turn it into a positive. And now checking my work again, when I differentiate the cosine of x, I get negative sine of x, the negative sine and the negative here will give me a positive. Then this I know now is the general antiderivative of the original function f of x. So the important takeaway so far in this video is just the idea of an antiderivative. You're trying to write a function that when you differentiate becomes the function that you're starting with. All we're doing is going backwards. This should feel very normal. We've done it all through mathematics. We first squared or use exponents and then we introduce radicals. We start add and then we subtract. We have um, exponential functions and then we have logarithms. We have to have these inverse operations of each other to really be able to use something. And now we're introducing the idea of going backwards with differentiation or anti-differentiation. These rules again, I think this right here is going to be a bit awkward. We have this negative that pops out when we differentiate the sine and cosine. It'll be the opposite of what we're used to. Again, the derivative of sine is cosine. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. So when we go back Backwards with the differentiation, that negative plays a little bit different role, which will be awkward, but you'll get more used to that. The important thing throughout this section when you first start is take some, take some guesses, try something with the antiderivative, but just use differentiation to check your work and you should be able to troubleshoot the right answer after a few attempts.